Ever feel like uh, you're stuck in one of those work processes that feels about as efficient as, like, I don't know, a hamster wheel, you know? Uh-huh. Yeah, I know what you mean. We put so much emphasis on training and individual performance. But what if, what if the real problem is actually the system itself. It's like blaming the chef when the oven's broken, right? Exactly. They could have all the skills in the world, but if their tools aren't working... The dish is ruined. Exactly. Whole thing falls apart. And that's that's where this idea of Enterprise Process Performance Improvement comes in, or EPPI. We're doing a deep dive on that today. It's... Uh, think of it like process surgery for your organization. I like that. Our, our main guide for this deep dive is EPPI thinking, and they use this really cool tiered system to kind of break down, like how these processes actually work, and more importantly, I think, how to fix them when they're not working. Yeah, it's it's like playing detective almost. You're trying to uncover those hidden bottlenecks, really understand who needs what from each process. And it's amazing how often you'll find that like a small tweak kind of upstream can have this this massive ripple effect downstream. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Like a chain reaction almost. Exactly. So, okay, so let's unpack this tiered approach a little bit. Tier one, if I'm getting this right, it kind of flips the script on how we typically see an organization, right? We're not just talking about separate departments anymore, but more like this this web of interconnected processes. Exactly. Each department, if you think about it, is essentially a collection of processes. And then the enterprise itself, the entire organization, it becomes this kind of dynamic ecosystem where the output of one process is actually the input for another. All connected. It's all connected. It's about optimizing that entire flow. Okay, so instead of just looking at the org chart, we're tracing the actual journey of how things get done. Exactly. But then tier two. This is where we zoom in on the individual processes themselves, right? Yeah. Right, right. So like imagine we're looking at a sales department, for example, through this EPPI lens. Even within that one department, you're going to have different types of processes. You have leadership processes, core processes, and support processes. Okay, let's break those down a little bit. What exactly are leadership processes in this context? I think that's a good place to start. Yeah, so for leadership processes, think... Think big picture strategy. Imagine you've got the sales team and they're laser focused on, you know, their individual targets. They're crushing their quotas. Sounds great on paper, right? Right. Mm -hmm. But what if the company's overall strategy is actually to break into a new market, which requires, you know, more collaborative deals, more relationship building, that kind of misalignment where the day to day isn't really serving that big picture vision. That's a leadership process breakdown. It's about making sure that everyone is rowing in the same direction. Leadership processes connect the dots between that overall strategy and the the day-to-day -day actions. Got it. Yeah. So that's leadership processes. Then we have the core processes. These are like the heart and soul of what the department actually does, right? Exactly. Yeah. So so for our sales team example, it's all the nuts and bolts. Making those calls, managing those client accounts, closing those deals, keeping the sales figures rolling in. It's the, it's the everyday work that, that keeps the lights on. Exactly. This is where things get really interesting to me, though, because it's not just about what's happening inside that one department. It's tier three, where we start to think about outputs and stakeholders. Mm -hmm. Because processes don't exist in a vacuum, right? Mm -hmm. They impact and are impacted by so many different players. 100%, yeah. Every process has to spit out some kind of output, whether it's a product, a service, a report, you name it, right? And that output needs to meet certain requirements. And those requirements, my friend, they come from stakeholders. Okay, give me the rundown on stakeholders, because I think when a lot of people hear that word, they just think of like the big boss who has to sign off on everything. Right, right. But it's so much more than that. Oh, it's way more than that. We're talking about a whole cast of characters here. Hmm. Obviously, you have your customers, your suppliers, but also you know, your employees, managers at different levels, executives, board members, even government regulators come into play. All of these groups, they have a stake in how a process performs, even if they're not directly involved in those in those day to day operations. There's like this. It's like this complex web almost of needs and expectations that all have to be kind of balanced and considered when you're actually designing and optimizing a process. It's a juggling act for sure. For sure. Okay, so we've got the, the what of processes down, mm -hmm. you know, the different types and how they fit together. But what about the how? That's where tier four comes in, right? Right. This tier, to me, feels like you're almost flipping over the process mm -hmm. and seeing all the little, like all of the machinery underneath that's actually making it work. 
Exactly. The source material here, they call these the enablers. And this is a big one because enablers can really make or break a process. Think of it like a car, right? You've got the engine that's your process. But you need fuel. You need a well-tuned transmission. You need good tires. You need all the parts working together. All the parts, yeah. And in a work setting, these enablers can be anything from technology and resources to the actual knowledge and skills of the people who are doing the work. And this is where I think we often trip up, right? Yeah. No. We just assume that everyone kind of magically knows what to do and how to do it. Oh, it's such a classic mistake. And I've seen it happen time and time again where we'll see a problem. We jump to training as the solution. We think, oh, if we could just get everyone on the same page. If we could just train them better. Exactly. But you're not addressing the root cause. You're basically putting a Band-Aid on, you know. A much bigger problem. A bullet wound. Exactly. Yeah. And the source material actually identifies 12 types of enablers. 12. Okay, so it's not just about having the right skills mm -hmm. or knowing the process steps like by heart. It's bigger than that. Yeah, We're talking about the tools they're given, the quality of the data they're working with, even just something like the company culture. That can be an enabler or it can be a blocker. It really can. It's about understanding the entire ecosystem in which that process exists. The ecosystem. Yeah. And that can get that can get pretty complex pretty quickly. And this actually brings us to what I think is maybe the most fascinating part of this whole model, and that is tier five, the enabler provisioning system. This is this is where my mind was blown a little bit. Yeah. Because it's like realizing that even the things that are supporting the process have their own processes behind them. It's like this, it's processes all the way down. Exactly, exactly. And it's a rabbit hole worth going down because it helps you trace the problem back to its source. So let's say, for example, you discover that a sales team isn't using their CRM software effectively. Okay, so that sounds like a technology enabler issue, right? Yeah, it could be right. So maybe they haven't had proper training on it. Right. But what if you dig a little deeper, right? What if the issue isn't with the sales team's ability to use the CRM, but actually with the IT department's processes for for selecting, deploying, supporting that software in the first place? Oh, interesting. Maybe the CRM itself is clunky. Maybe it's difficult to use or it doesn't integrate well with the other systems that the sales team relies on. So suddenly the problem isn't with the sales team at all. It's not even in the department you thought it was in. Exactly. It's with how the technology is being managed at a at a higher level. So you're saying sometimes the problem isn't even in the department you thought it was in. Often. It's like it's I'm like blaming the chef when the oven's broken. Exactly. And EPPI helps you kind of find the real root cause, even if it's hiding in a completely different part of the organization. Yes. And that's that's the beauty of this model is that it forces you to think beyond those departmental silos and really see the organization as this interconnected web of processes where everything is impacting everything else. OK, so we've we've gone deep down the rabbit hole here of these EPPI tiers, and I think we have a good understanding of how this whole thing fits together. I hope so. But how do we actually PUT this knowledge to work. You know, that's where that's where targeting EPI and intervention initiatives comes in, right? Exactly. It sounds a little intimidating, if I'm being honest. A little bit, yeah. Like, where do we even begin? Well, it's about taking action. It's about not just taking any action, but very targeted data-backed action. That's what sets EPPI apart. So walk us through it. What are these two stages all about? Okay, so stage I, targeting EPPI. It's all about speed and accuracy. We're talking about figuring out the what and the how much. Okay, so like, what are the specific gaps in our processes? How much are those gaps costing us in time, money, missed opportunities? And then what's the potential return on investment if we actually fix them? Yes, exactly. It's like that old saying, you know, measure twice, cut once. You don't want to launch into this massive process improvement project without knowing if it's going to be worth it. Stage I gives you that data-driven foundation to make those informed decisions. And then comes stage two, intervention initiatives, where we actually like roll up our sleeves and put these implement these targeted fixes. Exactly. Feels like we're not just slapping on band-aids here. We're talking about real systemic change. Absolutely. And it's not a one and done deal either. Right. Think of EPI as a continuous improvement loop. You're constantly analyzing, tweaking, refining, trying to achieve that optimal performance. So it's like this. It's almost like this. Uh, I don't know, like constantly evolving organism, you know, yeah. adapting to new challenges and new opportunities. That's a great way to put it. Yeah, it's very organic. This is. This is giving me a lot to think about already, and we're just getting started. It's a lot to unpack for sure. It's like we're we're swapping out that old uh, 
fix it as you go mentality, you know? Yeah, the Band-Aid approach. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> For something much more like proactive, like let's actually optimize the whole system kind of approach. Precisely. And that's that's where things get really interesting, I think, because even with the best intentions, even if you have this like crystal clear process map, you're still dealing with that human element. Oh, for sure. Remember all those stakeholders we talked about? Oh, yeah. Each one with their own like wish list for how they think things should run. And those wish lists, let's be honest, they don't always align. They don't. In fact, that's that's one of the biggest challenges in process improvement is those conflicting stakeholder requirements. You're trying to make everyone happy. It's like herding cats sometimes. You know, it really is because everyone I mean, I think in theory, everyone wants what's best for the organization. But what best means that can be very different depending on like where you sit, you know, 100 percent. Yeah. Your perspective really shapes your reality in those situations. And the source material, actually, they outline 12, 12 generic stakeholder categories, okay. 12. Yeah. You've got your customers, your suppliers, employees at all levels managers, executives, the board members, government regulators, on and on and on. So many different perspectives to consider. And each of these groups, they bring their own viewpoint, their own priorities. So how do you even begin to balance those competing interests? Right. Because you don't want to get stuck in analysis paralysis. Right. Or even worse, you know, make a decision that pleases one stakeholder group, but completely throws another one under the bus. Yeah, you don't want to create more problems than you solve. Exactly. So how do you how do you even navigate that? What's what's the approach? Well, it's it's a delicate dance, that's for sure. <laughs> There's no magic formula unfortunately. Yeah. But I will say this, data is your best friend in this situation. Okay. Remember those measurements we talked about in stage I of EPI? Yeah. That's where those become absolutely crucial mm -hmm. because it allows you to understand the actual impact of those different stakeholder needs. So instead of just going with our gut or, you know, playing favorites. Which is so easy to do. It is, it is. But you're saying, look at the hard numbers. Right. Let the data guide those decisions. Exactly. And this actually brings us back to the concept of those master performers we talked about earlier. Remember, those are the individuals or, or teams who just consistently knock it out of the park. Right, right. Even when they're faced with complex processes and, you know, these demanding stakeholders, they always seem to find away. They just have a knack for it. They do. And I think part of that is they have this almost like this intuitive understanding of those stakeholder dynamics interesting, and how to navigate them effectively because they're on the front lines, right? They're dealing with these competing demands day in and day out. So they often have these really valuable insights that, that we can learn from. Yeah. Like they're, they're in the trenches. They see how it's actually playing out. Exactly. That, that actually reminds me of a time at my previous company. We were, uh, we were in a bit of a sales slump and we kept, you know, throwing training at the problem, thinking, OK, maybe the sales team just needs to like brush up on their closing techniques or something like that. Right. But it turned out the real culprit was the CRM system that we had just implemented. Oh, interesting. It was so clunky. It was so counterintuitive that nobody actually wanted to use it. They were actively working against the system. They were. Yeah. Because it was more work than it was worth. Wow. See, that's that's a classic case of mistaking a process problem for a people problem. Right. And it happens all the time. All the time. So yeah. it's like instead of blaming the chef, we should have been looking at the oven this whole time. Exactly. And that's why I think this whole EPPI approach is so powerful. It gives you this framework to mm. tackle those those process level issues mm -hmm. like head on rather than just trying to like slap a bandaid on the symptoms. It's about Working smarter, not harder, right? By optimizing those underlying processes that are driving everything you do. Exactly. And remembering that, like, even those enablers that wow. we talked about, you know, the things that are supposed to be supporting our processes, sometimes those are the bottlenecks. All too often. Yeah. Like, it, it's not the people. It's the tools they're being given. Yes. Remember those enabler provisioning systems? Oh, yeah. The processes behind the processes. Processes all the way down all the way down, they need just as much attention, if not more, as the core processes themselves. Because, for example, if your IT department isn't set up to properly select and deploy new software, it doesn't matter how much training you give the sales team on how to use that software. Exactly. It's a moot point. Right. And this highlights another thing that I think is really important here, which is collaboration. Oh, absolutely. You can't optimize a process in isolation. You have to have buy-in and input from everyone who's actually involved in that process. Yeah, it's a team effort for sure. And I think that's where 
that's where EPPI can be really transformative for organizations. How so? Because it, it forces that cross-departmental teamwork. Right. It's not just like, oh, this is the sales department's problem or this is the IT department's problem. It's it's everyone's responsibility. It's a shared responsibility to make the organization the best that it can be. And this ties into another important concept from the source material, and that is this idea of EPPI as this like continuous improvement loop. Okay. Yeah. Talk about that. It's not about reaching this like mythical endpoint where everything runs perfectly forever because that's just not realistic. Right. Right. There's always going to be a new challenge, new technology, a new competitor that's going to force you to kind of adapt and evolve. The work is never done. The work is never done when it comes to process improvement. Exactly. But that's also kind of exciting in a way, right? It is. Because it means you're always learning, you're always growing, you're always getting better. It's about progress, not perfection. I like that. And and that's the beauty of this whole approach is that it's not about achieving some like static state of perfection, which is, like I said, an illusion. It's about embracing change, mm-hmm. seeking out those opportunities for improvement and just constantly striving to be better than you were yesterday. It's about building a culture that doesn't see challenges as roadblocks. Right. But as as opportunities for growth and innovation. Now you're speaking my language. That's what it's all about. It's about moving beyond the blame game and embracing that shared responsibility for optimizing the systems that drive your success. And it's not just about, you know, the bottom line either. Right. It's about creating a work environment where people feel empowered, they feel engaged, and they're excited to contribute their best work. Because when the processes are working smoothly, everyone benefits. 100%, yeah. So with that in mind, you know, how do we actually begin to implement these changes? How do we go from, you know, understanding these concepts to actually seeing tangible results? What's the next step? That That's the million dollar question, right? It is. And that's where the real work begins. But the good news is our source material doesn't leave us hanging. Okay, good. EPI thinking, they actually outline some very practical tools and techniques that organizations can use to put this knowledge into practice. Okay, so less theory, more action. Yeah. I'm into it. Give us a sneak peek. Yeah. What are we going to be unpacking in the final part of our little EPPI deep dive here? <laughs> so we've got this like this powerful toolkit now, right? This EPPI thing to really kind of analyze and, and diagnose those organizational growing pains that I think we all feel. We've all been there. But I think, you know, for a lot of us who are listening, we're probably thinking like, okay, that's great, but where do I even start? You know, like it can feel overwhelming to think about like overhauling these these entire systems in an organization. Yeah, it's a big task. It's like that old saying, how do you eat an elephant one bite at a time? Right. You don't need to boil the ocean here. Just take it one step at a time. And our source material, EPPI Thinking, they actually give us some really practical tools and techniques for for putting this knowledge into action step by step. Okay, good. So less theory, more action. Mm -hmm. I like it. What's our first bite? What do we do? Well, remember those intervention initiatives we were talking about in stage two? Yeah, yeah. This is where we get to roll up our sleeves and actually make those targeted improvements. And the book suggests starting with something called the Six Sigma DMAIC methodology. DMAIC. Okay, that sounds a little... uh... A little intimidating. Yeah, a little intimidating. It's not as scary as it sounds, I promise. Okay, good. It stands for define, measure, analyze, improve, and control. Okay. It's a very structured, data-driven approach to problem solving, which you know by now aligns perfectly with that whole EPPI mindset. Right, right, right. Okay, so walk me through, break it down for me. What do we do? Okay, so you start by very clearly defining the problem that you're actually trying to solve. That's your defined phase. Okay. And this is where those tier three and tier four insights from EPPI become super critical. Okay. Because you need to know, like, who are your stakeholders, what are their requirements, and what are those enablers that are either you know, supporting or hindering the process as it currently stands. Right, because you can't fix what you haven't identified. Exactly. you got to know what you're dealing with. So once you've defined that problem, then comes the measure phase. Okay. You actually have to collect data. You need to understand the current state of the process, how it's performing, where those bottlenecks really are. And this is where those key performance indicators, those KPIs, come in handy. Got it. Got it. So measure twice, cut once. We need to know where we're starting to know if we're actually making any progress. Exactly. Data is your friend. Then we move on to analyze. 
So we take all that lovely data that we've collected and we really dig deep to try to understand the root causes of those performance gaps, you know? Why is this process inefficient? Why are stakeholders unhappy? This is where we really connect the dots and identify those levers for change. And this, this feels like this is where ePPI's focus on those upstream enabler provisioning systems could be really, really valuable. Absolutely. Because, you know, sometimes the problem isn't even in the process itself. It's in those systems that are supposed to be supporting it. A hundred percent. Yeah. It's about looking beyond the obvious and really seeing that bigger picture. So, and then once you've, you know, hopefully identified those root causes, then you move on to improve. Okay. This is where you start to brainstorm, you test, and then you actually implement solutions to address those root causes that you've identified. Solutions, yeah. I like the sound of that. Right. So what are we talking about? Give me some examples. So these solutions, they could involve anything from like completely redesigning the process from the ground up, mm -hmm. maybe introducing some new technology that can streamline things, clarifying roles and responsibilities so everybody knows what they're supposed to be doing. Sometimes it's even something as simple as improving communication channels so people can collaborate more effectively. Oh, that's huge. It can be, yeah. It's often the little things, right? It's not always it's not always about some like massive, you know, tech overhaul or something exactly. like that. Exactly. Sometimes it's just about tweaking those those little things that can make a big difference. I like it. Okay, so we've defined, we've measured, we've analyzed, we've improved. Yeah. What's left? Well, the final step is crucial, and that is control. Mm. This is all about making sure that those improvements you've worked so hard to implement, they actually stick. Okay. So it's about creating systems and processes to monitor performance over time, track those KPIs, make adjustments along the way, because like we said, it's a continuous improvement loop. It's not a one and done deal. Yeah. It's about it's about building in this like this constant improvement into the like the DNA of how the organization operates. A hundred percent. And that's that's what makes this whole EPPI approach so powerful because it's not just like a set of tools or or even a methodology really it's truly a shift in mindset it's about embracing this culture of continuous learning experimentation and improvement and when you can get everyone on board with that that's when you start to see really transformative change happen yeah it's not about like you know pointing fingers when something goes wrong. It's about like, okay, how can we learn from this and do better next time? Exactly, exactly. It's about moving beyond the blame game, embracing that shared responsibility for, for optimizing those systems that are really driving success for everyone. Love that. And, you know, here's the thing. Even if you don't implement like a formal EPTI initiative at your organization, like tomorrow, right? simply understanding these concepts can radically change how you approach your work. Oh, absolutely. Just having that framework to look at things differently it's like yeah it's like next time i'm encountering a bottleneck or or a process that's driving me crazy right we've all been there instead of just like throwing my hands up in the air i can think okay what are the enablers here who are the stakeholders what can i do you know even in my own little corner of the organization to understand this process better and yeah. maybe identify some potential solutions exactly and that is exactly what this whole deep dive has been about. It's about giving you that knowledge, giving you the tools to see those opportunities for improvement, even in those, like you said, those little corners of your organization, wherever you might be. It's been quite a journey. Mm -hmm. I feel like we we started up in the clouds with these high level EPPI tools. They did, and now we're down here in the in the weeds with these these very practical, like nitty gritty improvement techniques. It's been eye opening. I agree. I think, you know, so often we get caught up in the day to day. We forget to step back and really look at the bigger picture of how things work. And hopefully by understanding those underlying processes and the systems that are driving everything, we can start to work smarter, not harder, and ultimately create more success for ourselves and for our organizations. I love that. Yeah. So the next time you find yourself facing a process that feels about as exciting as I don't know, watching paint dry. Been there. <laughs> <laughs> remember, remember what we talked about today. Grab your detective hat, channel your inner process improvement guru, and just ask yourself, what if we tried something different? You might be surprised by what you discover. You just might. Until next time, keep asking those questions and keep diving deep.